This is Law Bites, a podcast with Michael Geist. The backlash is getting personal over Public Safety Minister Vic Tave's plan for the surveillance of cyberspace. Now, unflattering quotes from his divorce are being posted on Twitter. But more importantly, the negative reaction includes some conservatives, and that is having an effect. It's too intrusive as it, as it currently stands and does need to be uh, uh, looked at. There's, there's a lot of concern, I think, uh, across the country as well. With comments like that from his own backbenchers, the Prime Minister signaled flexibility. Well, we will ensure that Parliament fully studies this bill and that uh, private, uh, private life is also protected in this regard. The political and policy battles over lawful access have been going on for decades, cutting across multiple governments, both liberal and conservative. The so-called zombie policy proposal resurfaced yet again last summer, as then-Canadian Heritage Minister Stephen Guibault included elements of lawful access within his online harms consultation. The government has pumped the brakes on those plans, but the lawful access issue is sure to return. Dr. Christopher Parsons is a senior research associate at the Monk School's Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto where his research focuses on third-party access to telecommunications data, data privacy, data security, and national security. He previously appeared on the podcast to discuss questions about the use of Huawei equipment in Canada's telecom networks, and returns to talk about the history of the lawful access debate, the implications of warrantless access to subscriber data, and the recent revival of the lawful access issue. Chris, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. You know, I'm really glad that you, you've, you've come on again. You were on, um, I think it's almost now a couple of years ago, talking about Huawei and some of the security issues there. And we're going to get into another um, another issue that, that's preoccupied government for a long time. Uh, I'll just start by noting, you know, that the government government's online harms plans appear to have hit a speed bump. They're, they're what we heard report was, was pretty candid that there was widespread criticism of the proposal that was floated by then Heritage Minister Kipo last summer. And it appears that the government's ready to at least send some of those issues back for reconsideration, this time by a new expert panel. But buried in that proposal, and it didn't get a ton of attention, was the revival of what you've, I think, rightly characterized as a zombie policy proposal, because it keeps coming back, lawful access. This has been going on for about 20 years. It feels as if I think I've been around for just about all of it. Can you start us off with a bit of a background on lawful access and this longstanding effort of law enforcement to gain warrantless access to subscriber information? Yeah, absolutely. And and thanks again for having me back. So lawful access is a term that encapsulates a whole bunch of different uh, policing and security powers. And so it can include everything from production orders to mandatory wiretap uh, capability to data retention. Um, but, but the focus right now is on the prospect that the government will once again um, seek uh, access to subscriber data and or transmission data. Now, what exactly is subscriber data and transmission data? Um, both of those terms have tended to move around a little bit, uh, depending on the legislative schema. But we can go back to past legislation to get a good sense of what, as an example, subscriber data could include. And so that could include... Um, an individual's name, their address, their telephone number, email address, um, internet protocol address, as well as a, a series of mobile identifiers that are attached to their cell phone and cell phone subscription. Now, the consultation document also makes mention of transmission data. That isn't as well defined in past legislation. And so we've sometimes heard um, or seen that this would be done in regulation, perhaps. And so the specific terms of what that will include or not include um, is, is less apparent. Now, as you noted um, entirely correctly, you know, this has been going on since, you know, 1999, 2001, depending on how you want to do your math. But due to a series of civil liberties and business pushbacks um, since that time when lawful access first came onto the agenda in Canada, warrantless access to subscriber data has broadly been um, both uh, prevented from being passed into law while nonetheless being regularly brought onto the agenda by the federal government of Canada. And Why exactly does this keep coming up? Well, usually there's a cast 
of rationales that have been presented by different governments, conservative and liberal alike. Um, you know, warrantless access of subscriber data has been seen as necessary to, to address social ills, including prosecuting criminals and terrorists, identifying and prosecuting pedophiles, catching violent offenders, as well as to deal with cyberbullying of, of, you know, all things in, in the context of that list. I'm not saying it isn't serious, but the, the shift from terrorist to cyberbullying is a notable change. Now, why do we, why is this an ongoing issue? It really started in the shift to the information era or the digital era, or you know, however you want to call it. So really post 2000. So it was during this time that governments across the West began to seek new powers to access digitized information. And it really began in earnest following the 2001 signing of the Convention on Cybercrime. Now, just to give you an idea as to how zombie-like this legislation is, which I, I entirely agree with that um, assessment of it, you know, there was a consult in 2002, which saw over 300 submissions or so that led to further consultations in 2005, which ultimately led to the introduction of a, a piece of legislation called the Modernization of Investigative Techniques Act in 2005. Um, that did include uh, provisions that would enable the government to gain access without warrant subscriber information. It died shortly after it was introduced because uh, there's minority government and an election was called. Next, it came onto the agenda in 2007 when public safety be began consultations without civil society and academic involvement. Um, as you probably very well remember, Michael, um, you were the one that sniffed that out and brought it to the public's attention, which quickly led um, to increased engagement from non-business sectors and also led the, the then Minister of Public Safety, Canada at the time, Stockwell Day, to say that, there will, that the government would always require a warrant to obtain um, information. Uh, lawful access bills were then introduced in 2009. They were sent to committee, but they never left committee because the government's prorogued. We also saw bills in 2010, 2013 that include lawful access powers, inclusive of subscriber to uh, inclusive access to subscriber data in 2010. Now, separately, while that was going on between 2000 and 2013, there was also a push um, within Industry Canada to update something called the Solicitor General's Enforcement Standards. Um, which would have uh, mandated lawful interception capability um, on a range of telecommunications services that are currently, and to this date, excluded. So ultimately, we did see lawful access legislation pass um, into law in 2013. However, well, it did include a lot of production powers and data retention powers, things of that nature, data preservation, I should, I should say, not retention. Um, it lacked warrantless access to subscriber powers. So that's sort of where we got to from, you know, from 2001 or so to today, it keeps coming up time and time and time and time again. And it's worth noting, and we'll probably touch on this a little bit more in our discussion, that while these legislative processes were under underway, starting around 2006 until a uh, Supreme Court decision, which I uh, expect we'll touch on, um, law enforcement was actually gaining access to subscriber data without warrant. And so, you know, we were in a moment where the government was trying to make something lawful while also sort of doing an end run uh, around the law um, that ultimately we got sniffed out on. And I would just note that in addition to the online harms console bringing up uh, warrantless access to subscriber data and, and um, transmission data, there's also a process to which Canada has signed on to um, in, in uh, 2001, the Council of Europe Cross-Border Surveillance Treaty, which does include um, provisions to make available subscriber data to law enforcement agencies. So at the same time that we're discussing sort of the online harms process, Canada has now um, agreed to, uh, at least uh, in theory, that this isn't something they're looking to introduce into law. Now they could opt out of that provision in the treaty, that is possible, but um, there's definitely been a bunch of work going on internationally at the same time. Okay, that's that's a that's a really great uh, historical look at, at how this issue has evolved. A bit tiring just to see how uh, to to revisit in many ways so so many of the fits and starts that that existed. It, it I must admit it occurs to me as having sat in on a whole series of the different meetings with differing government officials over time that their rationale for this continuously changed. It was 
whatever the, the hot issue of the day was tended to be the justification for lawful access. It was terrorism post 9-11. It was anti-spam at one point in time. It was uh, kids related, children related issues, endangerment related issues for on another stretch. I mean, it really just continually seemed to change, all, often without a really strong evidentiary case for why these changes were needed. Now, one of the other big factors that you didn't cite, because it didn't come from government, it came from the Supreme Court of Canada, was the Spencer case. But before we get to that, which was at least a bit of a game changer, I, I would argue in terms of one of the reasons why there was a little bit of a jump there from where things stopped five, six years ago until today, in part because the court's decision had a pretty big impact. Um, and that is how the telecom companies themselves were addressing this issue during this period. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how they were cooperating in many respects with law enforcement around this question, which of course then had some impact in terms of uh, the Spencer case at the Supreme Court. Yeah, absolutely. So pre-Spencer, which took place in 2014, um, there was an agreement that had been set up between Canada's large telecommunications companies and law enforcement agencies. And so uh, what was agreed to was that when law enforcement agencies were investigating um, child sexual abuse material, or it is sometimes referred to in Canadian um, documentation, child pornography, uh, when law enforcement was investing this kind of material, they could contact telecommunications companies and obtain subscriber data without first seeking a warrant. Now, this began in 2006, um, the Canadian Coalition Against Internet Child Exploitation worked out this exception sort of as they saw it. Um, by way of looking at PEPITA, which is Canada's federal commercial privacy legislation. And within PEPITA, there is a section that states that, you know, when lawful authority is asserted, that it is permissible for information to be disclosed. So what the telecommunications companies and law enforcement came to an agreement about was that when uh, law enforcement came and made this request, they were making their request under lawful authority and as a result could obtain the information. Now, you know, this was not done out of nefarious reasons or goals, right? I mean, telecommunications companies and law enforcement both saw this was a, a, a serious social issue, and they're trying to figure out how can we facilitate the investigation of, of serious crimes. That having been said, um, in 2001, the Privacy Commissioner of Canada went and did, uh, I mean, sort of a fact-finding study and they contacted a whole bunch of telecommunications companies across Canada um, and, and said, hey, how often are you guys actually disclosing subscriber information in these cases amongst a bunch of other questions? Um, they discovered, and then as uh, you uh, uh, discovered yourself, Michael, and then made public, <clears throat> in 2001, or sorry, 2011, there were approximately 1.1 million requests for subscriber data, which you know indicated that either Canada had you know, probably one of the most rampant child sexual abuse um, epidemics in the world, or this information was in fact being collected to investigate non-child sexual abuse material cases. And in fact, um, subsequent reporting by CDC and, and other groups indicated that law enforcement was regularly obtaining uh, subscriber information for non-CSAM related cases. And as a result of, uh, I think a lot of the attention was brought to the issue, as well as processes that have been worked at the courts, eventually we get to Spencer, um, which uh, is, is, you know, where the Supreme Court of Canada ultimately comes to the decision that, in fact, you cannot um, use this uh, element within PEPITA, and in fact, uh, law enforcement has to obtain a, a court order before they can gain access to subscriber data. Okay, sure. Why don't, and why don't we do just that? Let's, if you can just expand a bit on Spencer. I mean, my recollection, some of the debate at the time was, of course, the conservatives who were in power. And I remember appearing before committees and having some conversations with um, conservative ministers or MPs, and they were so insistent that this information was, you know, so-called phone book information. It, it just didn't carry any sort of privacy import. Uh, and those conversations took a dramatic turn once the Supreme Court had ruled in Spencer. Yeah, so Spencer was, you know, incredibly momentous moment. So, you know, at a high level, Spencer was a case where um, law enforcement agencies um, had obtained um, an IP address that had um, been assigned to a Canadian telecommunications company. 
they had strong reason to suspect that um, that IP address was linked to the transmission of child sexual abuse material. And so they went to the tele telecommunications company um, that uh, was associated with the IP address and asked, you know, can you provide us with subscriber information that's associated with this IP address? Uh, the telecom provider did. It turned out that the ind individual who was revealed was a family member of the individual who's transmitting child sexual abuse material. So it did not actually identify the individual in question. Um, this led to an argument being raised that the disclosure of subscriber information was uh, uh, an inappropriate intrusion into uh, the privacy. And this was because no judicial authorization had been obtained prior to the disclosure of information from the telco to law enforcement. This ultimately went all the way up to the Supreme Court, hence the Spencer case, as it's now called. And, you know, the high level, what came out of Spencer was it was found that the lawful exception to PETA that had been relied upon both by telecommunications companies as well as law enforcement agencies did not, in fact, mean that law enforcement agencies weren't required to obtain a warrant prior to accessing subscriber information. So since that decision, um, law enforcement agencies across Canada have, you know, arguably understandably complained that it is considerably harder and it requires more time for them to obtain subscriber data because now they have to go through the court process, um, demonstrate um, grounds to obtain the information. And that both means that they're taking more time um, to write the warrants. And then in some cases, obviously it can take some time to get a response back from companies once they've uh, filed requests for data. So that's sort of where we are. But one thing I think is really important to caveat and you know note is that the concerns that law enforcement agencies have had since Spencer is that what they were doing prior to that was found to violate the charter. And so many of the provisions, many of the activities that governments have made prior to Spencer and many of the contemplations of the Online Harms Act or, or uh, uh, consultation report, I guess, all revolve around, we want to get back to a situation where we enjoy um, the charter infringing data access rights that we used to have. Now, there might be good bureaucratic reasons for that, which we can discuss um, as to why they want that. But nonetheless, what we're talking about is law enforcement wanting to go back to a time when they were undertaking activities that were you know, found to be in violation of charter. Yeah. So, I mean, so what's their argument for that beyond that life is more challenging to get this, get, you know, to complete investigations or to conduct some investigations because they've got to comply with these rules? Is it, is it strictly that or um, are there other policy arguments or legal arguments that they seek to raise? You know, some of this depends on who you're talking to. Um, so, you know, I, and, and I, I suspect that you in many cases as well, have been in discussions with, you know, numerous law enforcement officers, uh, sworn officers, members of the Justice Department, um, you know, public safety officials. And so I think it's probably easiest to divide it into two groups. Um, the first is, there is the RCMP's National Child Exploitation Crime Center. And so they want access to this information because they don't actually tend to prosecute cases, but they are the intake source for a lot of the reports of, of CSAM materials. And so they're not prosecuting. They want to figure out who they should be punting information to at a local force level, who would then be responsible for taking up cases. So in their case, the reason they want subscriber data is not because they're also investigating terrorism or they're also investigating, you know, lost puppies or something. They want to be able to send information to the appropriate, uh, uh, more local law enforcement agency. So they have a, a bureaucratic reason for wanting to do that. We can talk about that a little bit more if, if you'd like going further. The other group, however, and the largest group, which is sort of frustrating that wants access to subscriber data is all of the non RCMP National Child Exploitation Crime Center groups. And so this is for, you know, almost every crime imaginable. Um, I mean, I, I've been in rooms where, you know, people from your CMP's uh, uh, Child Exploitation Center are like, we need it for this purpose. I'm like, okay, that may, there might be something to work with there. But then in the same time, there's local law enforcement officers who are like, well, when we find mobile phones, we need to have, find a way of like returning it. So we need access to subscriber data to like walk your phone back to you if you lose it or, you know, any number of other arguably much more trivial reasons to gain access to these sorts of powers that step beyond what, you know, law enforcement might be expected to do. 
And so we have really substantive variances in what these powers are for. And I think this goes back to, you know, what I mentioned a little bit earlier, like, why do these powers get raised? Well, we need to fight terrorism, we need to fight cyberbullying, we need to fight ch uh, uh, child abuse materials, like, the rationale shift rather dramatically. And it means that it, it, as soon as there's any possibility of maybe there's some negotiating space to deal with one of these major crimes, every other law enforcement agency seems to want to jump up and say, oh, well, we need it too now. And I think that that's led to a lot of, you know, frankly, bad blood between um, a, a lot of civil liberties groups and, and law enforcement, because anytime they try and have these more meaningful discussions and try and figure out if there's a situation in which it might make sense to figure out an exception, they sort of get slapped around and have to say like, hold on, I can't support anything. So if I support anything, then, you know, local beat cops are going to want to have access to this data as well, just to return a phone or something. And, and that's clearly inappropriate. And that's a fabulous point. And it's entirely consistent with my experience. I recall at one point, uh, I, sort of help facilitate a meeting between a number of law enforcement groups and or law enforcement and uh, some of the civil liberties groups, hoping that there could be some of that middle ground. And um, despite what I thought was going to be good faith efforts, it, it just broke down completely for precisely the reasons you just described. Um, that's there, you know, so, so from a law enforcement perspective, we see sort of some of these differing uh, or ever changing rationales and some more, uh, compelling, let's say, than others. What's the privacy argument in return? Um, you know, so, you know, the response or part of the, their argument is often that this information just doesn't have much of a privacy import, leaving aside what the Supreme Court had to say in uh, Spencer. How do you respond to those arguments that, well, it's just data similar to what you might find in a phone book, but you're so, what are you, why are you so concerned? Yeah, so uh, I just want to start with one thing that, like, it struck me yesterday. Um, you know, this is the position that has regularly been repeated both by the Canadian government and other governments is law enforcement wants nothing more than, than what's in a phone book. And I was thinking, maybe that made sense a decade ago, right, when people still had more phone books. Um, but today, if, if you were to go out and, and sort of decontextualize this to a lot of Canadians to say, hey, so do you agree that there should be a centralized public directory that links your phone number, your name, and your home. And, you know, obviously there are still people in phone books and all the rest, but I think if you like just decontextualize it, people say, well, of course not. I'll be doxxed. I'll be harassed. I'll, you know, malware could be targeted to my phone or something like that. So I think it's important to note that the very notion that it's quote unquote, just phone book information, Canadians are more sensitized to that now. And that information is actually more sensitive today than it was, you know, a decade ago. So that's one thing. There's been a shift, I think, in, in privacy norms. But, you know, beyond that, um, subscriber data can be well in excess of, you know, quote unquote, phone book information. So it could include a lot of mobile identifiers. It can include your IP address. And, and that's an indication of, you know, that they, rather that can be an indication of places that you've uh, been online. It can be used, um, as shown by the OPC in, in a report that they put out, to link a lot of um, anonymous um, communications you may have had. And so they use the example of sort of a, a Wikipedia page where if you've edited, as soon as you have an IP address, you know, everything that someone has written or commented on in a Wikipedia page. So, you know, if, if I get access to someone's phone number, I don't immediately have the ability to um, uh, pull together all that information in the same way. Um, but phone book information for law enforcement is not just your mobile number. It, it might be that, it might be your home phone number. But it's, it's a lot of other identifiers that are incredibly regulatory. Moreover, you know, while we think of subscriber information as, you know, quote unquote, phone book data, the online harms consultation report also makes note of transmission data. And that's concerning because transmission data is incredibly ill-defined. We often see it as something as, you know, says something along the lines of it, it has this generalized characteristic, but we'll work out in regulations what this actually means. And so that means as, you know, people who are looking at the legislative process or the policymaking process, it's really hard to know what the government wants or means. And we know um, from, you know, a decade and a half of, of research that metadata and transmission data are incredibly sensitive, right? This is the kind of information it not necessarily a day-to-day -day law enforcement level, 
certainly at a national security level, metadata is what's used to develop patterns of life online. It's used to understand what people do, even without having access to the content of the communications or transactions that are online. So it is very revelatory in, in, in revelatory in ways that, um, frankly, I think that as a result of the pandemic, um, more Canadians are aware of. And especially as we see more and more um, online activities, including doxing, harassment, bullying, and so forth, people are more and more sensitized to, you know, this quote unquote, just phone book information is very sensitive and can be used um, in any number of ways, well in excess of sort of the, uh, the don't worry about it ways suggested by law enforcement. That's a really good way to, to, to think about it, both in terms of those shifting privacy norms and why even on its face, this, this data raises some serious privacy issues. All right, so that's the, a lot of background just now, but uh, I think really important to build that foundation. Thank you so much for doing that. Now, one of the, reasons, one of the things that sparked this conversation was a, a lengthy post that, that you pulled together that focused specifically on the intersection between lawful access and child sexual abuse material, which would, of course, be one of those areas where you know, it's quite clearly, if you're going to have a compelling reason, that would be be one of them. Now, as I say, so that's that's where there's going to be, a, in some, some ways, a stronger argument. But yet you argue that there are significant challenges for law enforcement in investigating these cases that aren't solved by warrantless access to this kind of information. Can you describe um, that, that this area and, and what those might be. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I should note, you know, I I have strong reservations about, you know, warrantless access to, to subscriber data. I also am an incredibly strong proponent of, you know, as I will discuss, resourcing law enforcement to deal with these very serious cases. You know, I don't want to diminish, I don't want to suggest that you know, the, the availability and the transmission and use of child sexual abuse material is not a social issue. It is. But um, as I'll touch on, there's a number of factors that um, make the problem as serious as it is, and it can be addressed through non-warrantless access measures. So let me touch on some of those first. Um, the number of CSAM reports that law enforcement agencies receive can and often are be absolutely overwhelming. So there was a, a frankly not very good, but nonetheless, there was a piece that New York Times put out a couple of years ago that bombastically said that, you know, Facebook was reporting tens of millions of CSAM um, uh, reports to uh, child safety organizations. This was used as an indictment against Facebook as opposed to recognizing that Facebook has actually built probably one of, if not the best detection and reporting systems in the industry. Um, but Nonetheless, this showcases, you know, Facebook has a great system for reporting this stuff, and they're sending you know, upwards to 40 million requests a couple, as of a couple of years ago. As more companies adopt um, better and more robust methods of detecting CSAM material on their platforms, we're going to see more reporting. If you're a law enforcement agency, you know, that's a lot of requests, right? And how do you deal with them all? So first, the number of reports that are getting sent in are often overwhelming. Second, the information received by law enforcement in other situations can be quite stale. So in situations where there's a major bust, right? So servers are seized or an individual is busted and the communications logs are available or, or something like that, right? You know, it might be the case that this is a coordinated measure, including the RCMP, but it also might be a case that where the RCMP is present. And in those situations, those latter situations, the RCMP may actually get a dump of data as a result of uh, the, the investigation concluding. But the information that's provided may be months or years out of date, right? Depending on how logs have been kept by uh, either the individual or, or the server that was busted. And so that means that when information gets to the RCMP or other local law enforcement agencies, they just can't do anything with it, right? Or they can't do anything meaningfully with it. And so the staleness of data means that they can get a lot of reports. It can take a bit of time to figure out if it is stale or not. And that can also stymie investigations and, and subsequent possible prosecutions. Third, acting on received data can also take some time. So there's this huge backlog and number of cases or, or allegations of, of CSAM materials that come in. You have to process it. And, and that's just not easy. And so um, with limited resources, despite this being a very serious crime, just getting around to looking at these reports and actioning them can take some time. And, and that 
time varies at the, at the level of government you're talking about, right? So when something's been taken to the RCMP, it might take them a little bit to go through and, and get court orders and something like that to figure out who, who sub, which subscribers may be associated with it. Um, and as a result, it takes some time to then punt it down to more regional law enforcement who might have to wait for officers to be made available to do the investigation they're going to do it. And so you can see this cascading um, delay that is built in. Moreover, you can get into situations where um, if the data is stale and if law enforcement takes some time to, to action it, uh, telecommunications companies may not have the records that are needed to associate uh, a past IP address or other identifier with uh, a subscriber at the time. And so again, you can be in situations where data is taken, um, by the time you get around to working on it, um, even if you do get a court order, even if you do file it in a telecom, you may get nothing out of that. Fourth, um, there's a, uh, having spoken with some, some law enforcement officers as, as well as um, some, some telecommunications executives, production orders for subscriber data are often not just for subscriber data anymore. And so now that um, in many cases, now that law enforcement officers um, have to write or have to obtain a judicial order before they can get subscriber data, they're not just asking for subscriber data. They're asking for a lot more data all at once, which from a warranting perspective may make some sense because if you're already doing the work, you might as well ask for everything you need. But this has the effect of requesting large volumes of data from communication service providers. And so, you know, responding fairly quickly to a subscriber request might be one thing, but if there's a larger request, that can take much more time to process, to assess, to ensure that the appropriate legal grounds are being cited. And then frankly, to just go through the CSP systems and collect the data that's being requested as it still remains and is available. Yes, <laughs> you know, after you're the RSCMP, after you've gone through and you've done a lot of this, this work, frankly, to figure out who you should be punting these cases down to, although obviously some, in some cases they do take the cases up themselves, but often they're punted to local law enforcement. If you've punted it down to the OPP, TPS, um, you know, Calgary Police Service, you know, wherever you're sending, sending these, local law enforcement may be overwhelmed. They may not have investigators that are available. They may not have resources. They may not have the time. And, and they're getting a lot of these requests. And so they might see, okay, so we have like one person or one IP address associated with um, CSAM. We're gonna let that one pass because it's like one case of it. And we're, you know, maybe when there's a, a threshold that gets reached, then we'll have to assign resources. But often they don't have the staff that are trained and they just don't have the bandwidth to take up these cases, regardless of how serious is a society we see CSAM related um, cases. And so, all of what I've just mentioned are um, overcomable, or at least we can address them, and none of them require warrantless access to subscriber data. There's a bunch of different methods that we could impose through legislation. Um, and, you know, separate from legislation, it, it can just include massively resourcing up um, divisions that are responsible for handling these cases. We know that, you know, following 9 11 is one example. The RCMP massively shifted internally from uh, white collar crime to anti-terrorism, right? Um, so it, it is within the ability of the RCMP and other agencies to pivot on matters of great social importance should we so choose to. We could do that in this case. Um, I'm not saying that we must, but I'm just laying out that this is actually a policy option and we should take it seriously that it is a policy option and we have not taken that option up. Okay, so there are other options. And I mean, I was going to ask you, what you know, what else, if if not warrantless access, should we be doing? But you know, in that really comprehensive answer, I think you've, you've identified some of the kinds of things that we can do. You know, why don't why don't we close with, with this? Twenty years is is a really long time to be pursuing a, a policy, and despite the legislative failures, court failures, and the kind of policy evidence that you've just provided, you know, we see this issue persist. It just keeps coming up. You know, in your view, is this uh, is this destined to continue? And, and if it is, is there leaving aside or setting aside you know, your earlier comment that it's been tough to kind of find common ground or some sort of middle ground? Do you think there is a, a compromise solution to be had? Yeah, so I, I think this is zombie legislation. I think it will keep coming up until eventually some ground is achieved by law enforcement. Um, you know, you've been around this longer than I have, Michael, but um, 
that the same proposals keep coming up time and time and time and time and time and time and time again. And I, I can't see that changing. Um, that having been said, you know, is this, is there a compromise to be had? Yes. I think one of the things that's really needed is um, arguably a parliamentary study. I mean, it could be a study in any number of other dimensions, to be frank. Um, but I think having an open airing of the challenges faced by law enforcement in, in investigating this is really important. And, and not a bombastic one, not like, you know, there's millions of cases a year that we can't touch when there's some problems with some of that data as it's presented. But just to make clear to MPs that, you know, law enforcement needs resources and we need, we don't necessarily need new law. So to begin with, an open study to make clear and put facts on the ground so that we can actually debate this in a meaningful way. And, and I think that there is a real desire on the side of civil society and academia and business and law enforcement to figure out how to address child sexual abuse material. No one wants this stuff to exist. Now, where will this be going? Even if there isn't a parliamentary study, that, that, that new European treaty that I mentioned, we'll see Canada almost certainly work to use that as a set of new rationales for subscriber access, so along with some other law enforcement powers. Um, and there is, I mean, I've been in rooms and I, I, I suspect slash know that you've been in some as well, Michael, where, you know, civil society and um, the RCMP body that deals with, with child abuse were in agreement. Um, you know, one way forward for a very specific and very tightly delimited set of cases, specifically those related to CSAM, might be, you know, you don't get, the RCMP doesn't get subscriber data right? But rather what they get is sufficient information from telecommunications companies that um, the RCMP knows the services that should receive the offending material and logs from the telecom provider that, you know, detected or reported the, the CSAM material. And from there, local law enforcement can seek a production order to, to get the subscriber data and, and work through the judicial process. Now, what does that do? that doesn't provide anyone in government with the name or phone number or home address or IP address or something like that of an identifiable Canadian. Rather, it's a situation where, you know, RCMP gets a report that, you know, someone in Toronto um, is alleged to have been, you know, trafficking or transmitting um, child sexual abuse material and it gets kicked down to TPS and now they can decide if they're going to investigate. Like, that's one of the biggest problems that the RCMP has communicated more than once. And I think there's an easy, I, I think that's a perfectly fine solution, right? That's something that we can probably figure out, you know, we'll fight about the legislative language, but at the, at the level of principle, that has often been sort of knotted around tables like this might be a workable compromise. The problem is then that other law enforcement groups are like, well, we want it too, so we can return mobile phones, which, you know, needs to be off the table. But more broadly, I think what's needed is we need to think through online harms um, and bring in a number of groups that have often been pretty quiet in this space. So, you know, a lot of civil liberties groups and academics and government bodies and law enforcement, you know, we, we frankly come at it from a common angle. Um, we, our, our positions are pretty well staked if you, if you look online or just read our work. But people who aren't involved in a lot of this are like the trust and safety teams at big companies. Right. So there, there's work that's slowly coming out of the United States that relies on expert level interviews with trust and safety teams to figure out what works and what doesn't for addressing online harms, inclusive of CSAM material. Um, what do companies find work? What doesn't work? What reporting mechanisms are problematic or non problematic? So we need to open up how this is functionally operating in order to assess where there are resourcing difficulties, where there are policy issues to be worked out. And, and where things, frankly, should be let, let the same. I think probably the last thing I would just note is that one of the, the challenges when we talk about, you know, um, online harms, be it CSAM or, or bullying or, or malicious speech or doxing or, you know, whatever it be, there's often a, a focus on how can we ensure that we can get more data or technology companies will do something. and not saying that that isn't you know, a potential part of the solution, but 
where does an, a huge volume of child sexual abuse material, as an example, emerge from? It is produced often, not exclusively, but often in poor nations, where it isn't that you know family members are excited to do this, but rather they're so impoverished that this is seen as one of the necessary things they have to do in order to survive. This speaks to sort of a broader issue in child sexual abuse materials, which is recognized by many advocacy organizations around the world, where there are economic rationales that drive its production. Um, and so finding ways of um, ameliorating those economic needs is actually as important as anything else in addressing the CSAM um, plague, if you will. You know, it's important that we also target Canadians who are producing it here or involved in the production or are receiving it or transmitting it or using it. So I'm not saying we don't need legal rules or, or, or ways of addressing it, you know, domestically in Canada. But this is a broader global issue. And if we're going to address CSAM, we can't police our way out of the problem. The solutions are broader, they're more expensive, and, and they require us to focus more broadly on rectifying the very conditions that facilitate much of its production in the first place. Okay. I mean, you've highlighted such a broad range of issues. I mean, really disturbing thoughts, but important to consider uh, where this content comes from and, and the fact that in some ways, some of it's beyond our own internal law enforcement type solutions, to be sure. Chris, you know, this has been really one of those intractable issues. You've been a, a really important voice on it for many, many years. And I'm glad that you're continuing to to be a voice of reason that highlights both evidence and, and alternative solutions as we as we continue to grapple with something that, as you suggest, uh, is likely to be here for the foreseeable future as part of a policy debate. Thanks so much uh, for joining me on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. That's the Law Bites podcast for this week. If you have comments, suggestions, or other feedback, write to lawbites at pobox.com. Follow the podcast on Twitter at LawBitesPod or Michael Geist at MGeist. You can download the latest episodes from my website at michaelgeist.ca or subscribe via RSS at Apple Podcast, Google, or Spotify. The Law Bites podcast is produced by Gerardo LeBron LeBoy. Music by the LeBoy brothers, Gerardo and Jose LeBron LeBoy. Credit information for the clips featured in this podcast can be found in the show notes for this episode at michaelgeist.ca. I'm Michael Geist. Thanks for listening and see you next time.